I mentioned at the outset, the purpose of this briefing was really to bring charities and not-for-profits up to speed with the um, reform agenda, and we've identified the ACMC and the definition of charity as the two critical issues that our organisations need to be most across. The ACNC, I think we've covered pretty well, and you, you'll have a sense of both the opportunity but also some of the challenges engaged in that reform. The definition of charity is a um, slightly different proposition. Um, it has a similar history to it. It has a very long period of advocacy and a very strong evidence base behind it, and we'll come to that in a moment. But I guess from, from an ACOS perspective, it's an area of reform where it seems to us the sector isn't necessarily as across the detail in terms of what's important and what we want to be achieving out of it. So the purpose of the rest of the discussion this morning is really to, um, again, refresh some of the principles around where this reform has come from and then bring you up to speed with some um, current directions. So the status of that um, reform commitment as it stands and what might be some of the directions that we might take um, in terms of seeing that reform come to fruition and indeed what might be some of the consequences so we're going to begin this session with Esther Abrams. Esther is the Executive Officer of Changemakers Australia, which is an organisation based here but has done some incredibly important work nationally around the um, role that the definition of charity plays in terms of um, capacity to access, for example, philanthropic funding. And so an incredibly important issue for organisations in terms of shoring up their non-government sources of funding and again maintaining an independent a viable and a dynamic community sector. So I'm going to hand over to Esther, introduce her to you and invite her to open up um, the presentation this morning with an analysis around advocacy and the reform agenda as it relates to the definition of charity. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Tessa, for the uh, opportunity to speak today and thank you also to NAB for hosting the event and the lovely morning tea. It's most appreciated. So just briefly, for those of you who don't know Changemakers Australia, we're, we're a very small community-based organisation. I'm the, I'm the only employee and I'm part-time. But we play, I think, a very different and uh, important role in the community sector in Australia in that we promote social change philanthropy. So we're very interested in encouraging trusts and foundations to put their resources into tackling the root causes of social and environmental problems. And a very important aspect of that is, is advocacy, the ability of um, community organisations to advocate to improve the circumstances for, the, the, for their constituency and for the issue that they serve. Um, I came on board Changemakers nearly two years ago now to undertake some research on what the barriers were to charities, um, including trusts and foundations, doing and funding advocacy. Uh, and last year we released a report called Freedom to Speak, Capacity to Act. So why, why do I want to talk about advocacy today? Well, I think it's one of the things that really does unite so many of the organisations in the community sector. Um, from Changemaker's um, perspective, and I think many other people who I talk to in the sector concur that advocacy is a very effective way of achieving social change. You, know, you can uh, serve, serve the needs of the needy, uh, through direct relief, and obviously that's very important work. But the numbers never seem to go down. It is the work that you do to address the root causes uh, and to improve laws, policies, programs um, that makes a significant difference to people's lives. From, uh, from a philanthropic perspective, it's actually a very cost-effective way of helping organisations meet their charitable purposes. Uh, so getting them to tackle the, the root cause of the problem rather than just continually putting money into servicing those needs. Um, and of course there's, there's a very strong um, uh, issue around providing representation of disadvantaged people and, and the environment and that, that has a very significant public benefit. Now the project I work, worked on came out of a time in history uh, under the last Commonwealth Government where charities were publicly attacked for doing advocacy. Um, and it was a, a time when there was actually quite a lot of nervousness around uh, about uh, whether charities should or shouldn't be doing advocacy and how far they could go. So um, we wanted to really clarify the law regarding advocacy and to, um, uh, and to make that widely available to people to help promote uh, and empower people to do it. So just very briefly in terms of the results of that research, what, what we found was that the, the legal 
re restrictions on advocacy <laughs> hinged on this very old distinction, about 100 years old, between charitable and political, that ch charitable and political was somehow completely separate. Um, and their advocacy has never been banned, but um, except in Australia there was some clarity provided by the tax office that party political activity would be, wasn't on for charities. Um, the law certainly lacked clarity. So we spoke to many organisations where they said, well, we see the importance of doing advocacy and we want to do advocacy, but sometimes we are concerned about how much we can do before we start to jeopardise our charitable, um, uh, our charitable status, <coughs> how much advocacy is, is too much. Regarding trusts and foundations, philanthropy, they were much more restricted in their views about whether they could or couldn't fund advocacy. And certainly for philanthropic trusts who had in their trust deed uh, specified that they should only fund charitable purposes, and given that the law had said historically that political was inconsistent with charitable, that there were uh, that those organisations uh, often felt that they couldn't actually fund advocacy. However, those that particular type of trustee didn't apply to the whole philanthropic sector, but there was a much wider range of concern within the sector about funding advocacy, and, and a sense from some that it was inappropriate. And one of the, the things that, that um, the people in my organisation who are philanthropists have been really trying to do is to encourage trusts and foundations to, uh, to you know, look beyond that and start funding advocacy because it's so important. Not only is it important, it's absolutely legal. And the AIDWATCH decision uh, that the, uh, the High Court last year, 2010, I know it's actually nearly two years ago now, isn't it? 2010, that um, clarified um, that AIDWatch, um, an organisation that um, had had its charitable status revoked, um, it clarified that they were indeed a charity, um, not only despite of their advocacy, but actually because of their, their advocacy. So in making their decision, the High Court overturned the conventional legal view that political activity is not charitable. It said that that particular convention had limited application in Australia. So it wasn't just saying as of 2010 that there was a change, it was saying that actually this had never really been the case in Australia. So it was a complete uh, mind change in terms of charity law. And as a result of the AIDWatch decision, all charities now can have political objects. That means that in your constitution where you say what you stand for, uh, if, you're going to be, if you're a charity, they have to be charitable, so you have to be able to say that you should be for relief of poverty or education or, or one of the things that, that falls under the, the definition of charity. But in the past, there was concern about having an object that said you were there to, to uh, do law reform or policy work or campaigning work around that particular issue. Now you can have charitable objects, so there's no problem with that. And indeed, the High Court said that AIDWatch were a, a charity because they had a purpose of generating public debate to influence laws and policies on a charitable subject matter. So there's actually a new type of charity which has now come into existence. So the definition of charity actually expanded because of that decision of the High Court in, in 2010. So after giving you sort of guess a bit of a potted history of, um, of advocacy, um, I want to, to talk about the three key reform areas. I've listed them in the sort of, I guess, the, uh, in the sequence that they're meant to take place under the reform process, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to talk about them in that order. The first thing I want to talk about is the statutory definition of charity. And, and the, first, I guess the, the first question is, well, why should we have a statutory de definition of charity? And um, I'm borrowing very strongly from uh, Dr. Joyce Char at the moment, who um, presented a really great paper on this last week at a Melbourne Uni conference. And she was explaining how there are really sort of three, three general reasons why people want a, a statutory definition and why the, um, the community sector has very strongly advocated for this for a long time. First of all, it's the complexity of the case law approach. Like at the moment, what the definition of charity isn't something that you can just go to and pick up a document or a few pages that explains it. It is hundreds of years of decisions of courts um, that uh, are not necessarily just Australian courts, also English courts and other common law country courts that actually formulates that definition of charity. So that's very complex and, uh, and if you're not a charity lawyer, um, often very difficult to actually get your head around. There's also this issue about whether it should be the courts or it should be the government that decides what is or is not charitable. And in that, you know, there's actually, um, I guess, a, a, a range of views. Certainly one of the things that, I, um, that a lot of charity lawyers um, will point to is the fact that there's been so much wisdom in the court decisions over, over the history around 
charitable purposes, um, that they've actually done you know, a pretty good job. Uh, but of course there are gaps and there are things that we would like to see covered. And there are old things that hang in there for a long time that don't seem to get uh, pulled out. And that's probably where governments come in. But there's also this very practical consideration about how hard it is to, to change the law, for the law to evolve, when charities don't do litigation. So you need to get something in front of the courts for the court to make a decision. But if charities don't tend to litigate, or there isn't a conflict around something which leads to litigation, then you don't get a change in decision. And so that's where AWATCH was actually very important. And the tax office uh, actually did us a service by, uh, by challenging AWATCH and also um, enabling them to take it through to the High Court so that everyone could get clarity around advocacy. So, in a nutshell, it, it is generally agreed that, that the current definition that we have isn't actually terrible. You know, it's not something you need to throw out. Um, and, and particularly the AWATCH decision significantly improved what was seen as being one of the, the, the biggest problem areas. Uh, so that's something, I guess, to bear in mind in thinking about how to approach the statutory definition, which is not to say it can't be improved, of course. So how does uh, the statutory definition deal with advocacy? Well, as I've already discussed, the AWATCH decision largely removed the old case law obstacles to advocacy. And so for us, the first principle is that any new statutory definition has to reflect that as a, very, as a minimum around advocacy. When, uh, after the High Court made their decision, um, the tax office um, agreed to revise the charity's tax ruling to take into account the AWASH decision. And that was, was, it was great that they did that because they went through the process of actually thinking about the High Court decision, which in some ways had some areas it wasn't 100% clear, consulting about it and then trying to actually describe how they would actually relate that in their um, regulation of charities. And, um, and we were pretty pleased with the outcome of that. We had actually thought that they would try to claw, claw back more than what they, they did. In fact, they gave some things that we hadn't actually expected. So we feel, we feel that actually, you know, we've got to quite a, a pretty good place um, in terms of the law and the regulations around advocacy. But when the, the government did its initial consultation on statutory definition last year, the, the initial consultation paper really didn't reflect the AWATCH decision. In fact, it was asking questions about well, whether we should allow a level of advocacy. It started from the, from the wrong principle. So that's something that um, uh, if and when they decide to come up with a, uh, a new, hopefully a, a, some draft uh, legislation, that we hope that they have you know, leapfrogged that initial uh, space that they were in into being much more doing what, they, what the government has always said that they wanted to do with the statutory definition, which is actually to reflect the current state of the law. Uh, and certainly the government has made um, you know, statements about the AWATCH decision when it came in saying that it was okay. Uh, in fact, Bill Shorten, who was the minister at the time, said that it made sense to him that charities should be able to join the dots. Um, and if you're seeing a whole lot of people presenting with particular problems, they should be able to join the dots and advocate around those, those problems to government. And I guess um, we should also remember that in 2003, when our government tried to actually put in, um, introduce a statutory definition of charity through the, the, the Charities Bill, the reason it was killed off was because of the, the fact that it restricted advocacy, and that was something that the sector rallied around and said that it really wasn't on, and the bill ended up being pulled. So, um, so the government really does have to get this bit right, unless it wants to revisit history. So, Next on to tax, to tax concessions. Tessa mentioned before that there is a commitment to reviewing uh, tax concessions. Um, this particular um, review was initially introduced by Bill Shorten and it was very much a sense that we were going to get a regulator, we would then get a statutory definition and then there would be some review of how the tax concessions applied because at the moment there's, it's quite um, inconsistent the way tax concessions are applied to the charitable sector. It's very important to note that when it comes to the statutory definition process, which should be the next thing that happens, it has absolutely no bearing on any other tax concession other than tax concession charity status. So that's, that's, that's the ability to not pay income tax. There will be no single organisation that gets deductible gift recipient status because of a statutory definition. It's an entirely separate process, and I think that people often think, great, well, I get a statutory definition and then we'll get DGR. No, you won't get DGR unless the Tax Act is changed, and the Tax Act will be changed 
or may be changed as a result of this review that's happening of, of tax concessions. Um, the review of tax concessions is currently being worked on by a working group that's been set up by government, an independent group. It's got a lot of really fantastic people on it. Um, they were meant to be releasing something at the end of this year. They were given a very difficult job and that they were meant to talk about how you could actually better apply tax concessions and the extension of DGR is definitely on the list for that, but to do it um, in a cost-neutral way. So um, that um, is, of course, extremely challenging. And of course, the other challenge they have is that they don't have a statutory definition of charity yet, so they can't be absolutely sure who is a charity and who isn't, which makes it very difficult when you try to do the sums. But anyway, that's their job, they're the experts. Um, but in terms of DGR, currently half of all charities don't have DGR. And that is because the Tax Act um, actually gives a whole lot of other organisations DGR that aren't charities, but it only really applies to charities, a very limited number of charities that come under the, the relief of poverty, disadvantage, etc. head, and, and those tend to get PBI status or public benevolent institutions status if they do direct relief. But other organisations that tend to, tend to do advocacy, organisations like the COS organisations don't get access to PBI status, they don't get access to DGR. Um, and there's lots of other advocacy organisations that don't get DGR either. And, and other types of organisations like Changemakers isn't eligible for DGR either. <coughs> Neither is Philanthropy Australia. And the, the thing that we have in common is that we're all you know, pretty badly resourced. Um, so uh, it's a very important issue for organisations in the community sector. So in terms of the regulator, um, our view is that when the regulator gets started, um, knowing that, that the statutory definition, if it meets the timeline that the government has set, which is to have a statutory definition by the middle of next year, um, they will still have a period of time where they'll be operating without a statutory definition, and in that period they should just adopt the, the tax officer's charity tax ruling um, as the means by which they determine who is or who isn't a, a charity. But the other thing that, that the tax office didn't do when the Aid Watch decision came down was to look at the, the tax ruling for public benevolent institutions. Now the PBI tax ruling, even before the Aid Watch decision, was a bit confusing and not consistent, particularly in the way it deals with peak organisations um, that, have, that have members that represent people who do di direct relief. Um, one of the things that the PBI tax ruling has in it is, is a further restriction of advocacy. So PBIs are only meant to do advocacy that is minor um, in relation to all their other activities. And for very big PBIs um, that do a lot of direct relief work, it probably doesn't matter very much because they've got such a big pot of resources anyway that the bit they do around policy development advocacy, it looks minor in relation to everything else. But there are smaller PBIs that actually have um, organisations which where advocacy is much more uh, their core business and it's something that makes those organisations feel quite nervous. So we, we believe that very strongly the ACNC needs to do what the tax office refused to do and that is to review the PBI tax ruling um, to reflect the AWOSH decision. And then in the future there will be, there, there may well be demands from the sector to have a bit more education and guidance around aspects of advocacy. You know, where all of these issues around around definitions and around the law, it's the boundary issues which are the ones that pre present problems and uh, and where people can sometimes be a little bit unsure about where they what they should or shouldn't be doing. And so if there are demands within the sector for more clarity from the regulator, then the regulator should do that. But the regulator shouldn't regulate this area. You know, we should we should have a very much a freedom for organisations to undertake advocacy and not to be restricted through regulation. So just in conclusion, um, <coughs> it is really important that we get the regulator up and running, and that's obviously the first priority um, to make that to make that happen. Uh, Changemakers. Uh, believes that on balance we should have a statutory definition but it absolutely needs to enshrine the age decision and there may well be some other key asks from the community sector that the statutory definition should reflect as well. Um, but bear in mind the statutory definition will not address issues around uh, resources for, uh, for advocacy and for charities generally. Uh, in order for you to do that we need to have seen extension of DGR so, so it does uh, then 
show that there was a need to really get on and do some work around tax concessions. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. I had asked Esther to um, open up this um, second part of the briefing today because the work that change makers have done around the capacity to um, shore up non-government funding for advocacy really brings us to, in a nutshell, the issues behind the reform um, to modernise the definition of charity and why there has been ongoing advocacy for that reform. So thank you for that presentation and, and um, as we did for the first session, we'll break um, before the, the session closes to make sure we've got time for questions and discussion um, from you all. But I do just want to take the pulse of the room, I guess, before I get into where the, the reform process is up to currently, because the question about what's on the table, what we've achieved so far, and why we would continue pushing for reform is really about how well people understand the relationship between the definition of charity and the administration or the application of tax concessions. So, so just to recap, um, in, in a nutshell, what Esther's taken us through, the current position in common law, including the most recent case law, does allow for the recognition of advocacy as a legitimate charitable purpose. If it was legislated, if we had legislation that gave a, a legislative force to the current common law, based on the current standing, that would include capacity for advocacy to be formally recognised within the definition of charity. But none of that is enough to ensure that non-government sources of funding like philanthropic funding are available to those organisations that currently can't access the tax concessions that are often the trigger that process. It's not that you have to have those tax concessions to benefit from, for example, philanthropic funding. It's that the way a lot of that funding flows is by an assumption about what those tax concessions give you. And until organisations like advocacy organisations are able to access deductible gift recipient status and um, PBI status, public benevolent institution status, until that legislative change happens, the um, definition of charity will be a principle-only reform that won't actually change the issues around capacity and sustainability of charities and not for profit organisations. So that brings us to the, um, the status of the current effort to modernise the definition of charity. I just want to cover off on a bit of the context for this reform because, as we did earlier this morning, it's important to understand what the origins of the reform are to understand how we've got to the position that we are now. So there's been a, there have been a raft of processes that have looked at the definition of charity, particularly over the past um, 11 years. The, the sort of defining reform process was the Charity Definition Inquiry held in 2001. It set out a series of principles that it recommended define what a charity was. Um, change to the, the nomenclature in terms of what a not-for-profit is, but then very key issues around what we recognise as charitable. It found that a charity must have a dominant purpose or purposes that are charitable, altruistic, and for the public benefit. It found that the public benefit test should continue, that is, that it should be of public, that to be of public benefit, a purpose must be aimed at achieving a universal or common good, it must have political utility, and it must be directed to the benefit of the general community or a sufficient section of the community. And finally, it recommended that the public benefit test be strengthened by requiring that the dominant purpose of a charitable entity be altruistic. Now, like the Productivity Commission study that we discussed earlier, there were a whole range of other incredibly important recommendations. But in terms of our discussion today about the reform to modernise the definition of charity, these were landmark and defining principles that set a direction for the reform to the definition of charity. The Charity Definition Inquiry recommended charitable purpose, particularly in terms of how we would understand the activities that were covered within that definition. And I've set out the range of activities here for you to see because, as you can see, it's, it's um, fairly broad. It encompasses a whole range of um, the activities that we would generally um, think of as charitable, but that may or may not have clear coverage within, um, within you know, common law or may or may not have any coverage <coughs> within case law. Um, I realise that's probably a bit difficult to see. We, we will make these presentations. 
is available um, down the track, and all of this information is available um, offline. But really, the most significant thing um, in terms of um, the reform to date is that despite there being a very strong evidence base and, and very clear directions that could be taken in terms of the reform to modernise the definition of charity, in fact, the policy direction has been somewhat off course from um, the directions that were set out by this process. So the current status of the government's commitment to reform the definition of charity um, is that Treasury released a discussion paper in November last year, a month, possibly not even a month, several weeks before it released the exposure draft of the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission Bill. Although the discussion paper and other, um, other documentation around the reform have acknowledged the history of work in this area and have always acknowledged the 2001 process, in fact, they've steered a course pretty clearly away from the, the um, benchmarking that that 2001 process did. So Esther's mentioned, you know, once again, the question about advocacy seems to be up for grabs, as though we need to have, once again, a debate about whether um, charitable purpose should extend from providing a roof over someone's head to asking why we don't have enough affordable accommodation in Australia. So um, those sorts of issues are up for grabs. But probably more significant is the opening up of question around um, what is the role of recognition of public benefit in the, in the process to define charitable status. So in, our, in the ACOS submission in response to the discussion paper, we reaffirmed the protection for advocacy as a legitimate charitable activity. But we also picked up the Treasury's discussion around public benefit. So in the discussion paper, Treasury raised this question about whether there ought to be a new approach to the public benefit test. And from our consultation, both with our members and with community organisations more broadly, it was clear that there were different views across the sector. And um, in, a, in a sense, the different views are partly people coming to grips with the way that case law has really taken over the kinds of legislative debates that we've had, the um, welcoming of the AWATCH decision and, and others before it, and the perception that actually a lot of these issues have been dealt with by case law. So surely that's enough. And given all of the other work that we've got on our plates, do we really need to push for a legislative base to the definition of charity? So we recognise that there was a divergence of views within the sector. The councils of social service work together, so ACOS at the national level and the state and territory counterparts, including BECOS in Victoria, worked together to um, prepare a submission where we really picked up this question about whether there should be a new approach to the public benefit test. And we sought for the policy to return to the recommendations from the 2001 inquiry. And as we state here in this, in this um, quote from our submission, that's because the real issue that arises is not only the statutory definition of charity, charity itself, important as that is, it's a, that's in effect a statement of principle, but the real um, most significant element of this reform is the reform to the public benevolent institution status as that subset of charities whose main purpose is to assist the most disadvantaged in the community regardless of whether or not that's by direct service provision. So from a taxation, stat from a taxation standpoint, PDI status is much more important than charitable status alone because it extends to those organisations that fall under that broadened definition a much broader range of charity concessions through which they can subsidise or seek forms of funding for their activities. There's a number of issues that arise in relation to the current definition of charity <coughs> that are, um, in a sense, subsets of this, this fundamental question about how do we define charitable purpose and how do we show our support for it as a society, for instance, through the administration of tax concessions. Now, assuming that we've covered off on advocacy, assuming that it's um, covered in, in current case law and whatever the reform is, it gets picked up in that, there are some other remaining key questions that arise particularly from the 2001 definition inquiry. The first was that in that inquiry, there were very clear recommendations to ensure consistent treatment of charitable activities of not-for-profit childcare providers and of not-for-profit housing providers. So those two subsets of um, 
of the community sector were recognised as areas where there was significant inconsistency in terms of the application or the administration of tax concessions, significant inconsistency in terms of whether and how organisations were able to access tax concessions, which are the most significant benefit that they're able to get as a charitable organisation, and that that in turn impacts on all sorts of other ways that those subsectors are able to operate. Since 2001, not-for-profit childcare has been legislated for. So the, the sort of gap that was left in the policy terrain for not-for-profit childcare has been picked up. The one that remains without recognition is the area of housing providers. It remains without recognition as a legitimate charitable activity, and it remains without a consistent and a, a reasonable approach to ensure the application of tax concessions for those in the housing sector. It's a complicated issue. There is not a single easy answer to how we deal with the provision of housing in the context of charity. So if you, if you think, for example, about homelessness shelters, clearly charitable purpose, direct service delivery about getting the roof over, over someone's head when they don't have one otherwise. But in order to address that problem in more than a piece of your way, in order to ensure that people are able to live in circumstances but don't push them into homelessness in the first place, and able to regain secure and ongoing accommodation after a period of homelessness. The question that is up for discussion is affordable housing on a much broader scale. It's a much bigger set of issues. It relates to construction and development. It requires engagement with business at all levels to, um, to develop <coughs> affordable housing stock, as well as the kinds of policy mechanisms around um, you know, rent setting, around um, rent assistance, and around um, purchasing of of homes. It relates to a whole range of elements of the tax system, um, far beyond the definition of charity and its application to tax positions. <coughs> but if we're not willing to grapple with how housing is treated as a charity and how housing organisations are able to access tax concessions, we severely hamper the community sector's capacity to advocate for solutions to homelessness beyond shelter accommodation. And that, in a nutshell, is the, is the issue around the question about housing in the context of the definition of charity. <coughs> so, from an ACOS perspective, and that's a very particular perspective in terms of the, de the debate about the definition of charity, there are some really key questions that remain. The first is, what appetite do we have for another significant reform, given the work that was taken to get the ACNC to where it is now? And that's not just a question for the sector, it's a question for the government as well. We are very aware of um, trying times in government and um, how much work goes into every step of these reforms. But we're also very aware that we face a prospect where the, the reforms that have been achieved for charities and not-for-profits relate, um, relate to a regulator that has some very tough penalties and some very pointy ends of regulation available to it and they relate to some very clear, um, very clear new directions around who is able to access tax concessions and how within the charity sector. Potentially without shoring up what we regard as a, a current and appropriate and effective definition of charity, and without reviewing how that definition of charity relates to the kinds of tax concessions that as a society we think charities ought to be able to access. So the question about appetite for another significant reform doesn't stand on its own. There's a really serious question for us around what happens if we don't get those settings right in terms of the definition of charity and what flows from it. From that perspective, the, the question about whether it's enough to codify the common law is a really current and a really pressing one. It's something that we have regular discussions about across our membership. It's something that we hear often from people in the sector who have read and understood the AWATCH decision and have interpreted that as saying, well, we're okay. If, you, if your biggest concern was advocacy and making sure that you are able to advocate for systemic change as well as, as provide um, direct service delivery, then all we need to do is make sure that the case law is, um, is reflected in, in a statutory definition. But as Esther and I have both shown, the issue around the capacity of the sector to continue to thrive, to survive, to be effective, is very much around how we resource that sector. And given that tax concessions are the critical way that as a society we resource the sector, we need to make sure that the definition of charity flows to the administration of tax concessions. I'm a bit tempted to leave it there, 
and to open up the floor for discussion because, it, it, you know, through the, the morning I've heard a number of people raise these questions and I think it's actually an issue that a lot of people in the room have pretty clear sense of opinion about. So I'd like to open it up now for questions and discussion to either of us about the material that we've covered or more <coughs> significantly to um, the, the current status of the reform and where we think it's heading. So we've got a good 20 minutes for that discussion and then I'll um, come back with, with the next steps in terms 